government, and that is a matter of regret from the Smith Commission's position. That ends the statement from Deputy First Minister on the Smith Commission. We move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11756 in the name of Fergus Ewing on tourism, a legacy from 2014. I'll give a few moments for the front bench members to move their seats. Thank you. Could I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please? I call on Fergus Ewing to speak to and to move the motion. Minister, 13 minutes or so. Uh, Presiding officer, um, I've got a feeling in my bones that we're going to have a good debate this afternoon because we are reaching the end of what has been an incredible year for Scotland, has it not? I, I think that Scotland has been on the world stage as perhaps we have never before been in our history. And I knew that uh, 2014, resigning officer, was going to be an exceptional year when Lonely Planet named Scotland as the third best country in the world to visit. Now you're wondering, or some of you may be wondering, what were the first two? Well, they were Brazil and Antarctica, not our most immediate competitors, presiding officer. But there is a theme here and some logic to it about these destinations in the ranking. Because if you think about it, Brazil is hot, Antarctica is cold, but Scotland is cool. <coughs> boom, boom, presiding officer. Um, and of course, during this year, we have seen uh, a series of momentous major events being run. Uh, and these, of course, were led by the Commonwealth Games. And Summer brought Commonwealth Games where athletes achieved world record breaking success and 690,000 visitors attended events during Glasgow 2014 and Festival 2014, spending £282 million. And I'm delighted that Scott Taylor from Glasgow City Marketing Bureau can join us today. He's involved in the engine room of much of that sort of work. We also saw on the last day of play in the Ryder Cup Sky Sports golf analyst Butch Harmon said that the Ryder Cup 214 in Glen Eagles was, and I quote, by far the best organized Ryder Cup ever. And our year of homecoming in 214 offered a year-long program to welcome visitors to Scotland uh, and over 1,000 events across every part of Scotland and over 1 million people attending 55 funded events between January and September. And of course, presiding officer, these successes don't happen by accident. These successes, and especially the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup, were successes because of the enormous effort made by uh, huge numbers of people in the public service, Visit Scotland, Event Scotland, the police, Transport Scotland. Uh, and it was as a result of their efforts and those of volunteers, 12,000 in the Commonwealth Games and 1,800 in the Ryder Cup, that these events were a great success. And I'd like to thank every single one of those individuals, some of whom made a quite extraordinary personal effort and commitment to make sure that Scotland uh, was on the world stage and welcomed everybody to our country. I'm really proud that there are so many people in Scotland that made this year so special. Uh, but, of course, uh, business tourism also plays a major part in the success of our tourism and the ability to use these events and visitors to act as a shop window shows that we have uh, a great deal to offer for business tourism as well. Um, we set up the conference bid fund in 2012. It provides match funding to attract major conferences to Scotland. It was set up, presenting officer, because hitherto we were losing out 
to other locations throughout the world who were able to make payment of subventions, or as they might say in Glasgow, bungs, because we were losing out to those cities that were able to make financial inducements to attract conferences. So we set up this fund, and in brief, by the end of uh, October this year, after two years in operation, the conference bid fund had helped to secure 72 conferences, 84,000 delegates, and an estimated gross delegate spend of £143 million. There are 40 decisions pending on conferences supported by the bid fund. Not all of these will come to fruition. But based on the success rate that we have had at an investment of public money presiding officer of £2 million, uh, we would expect to deliver an estimated spend from all of the delegates that visit Scotland of £200 million by 2024. Now, that, together with the local authority, 50% contribution means that the return on that investment to the public purse, presiding officer, is an eye-watering 50 to 1. £50 pounds spend for £1 investment. That is quite a startling success story, is it not? Uh, certainly. Jenny Mara. For, for, um, I wonder if he can furnish the Chamber with any detail about how that investment was spread across the cities and regions of this country to make sure that that dividend, as he's just talked about, um, was shown in, in all our economies across all cities and regions and not just in the central belt. Minister. Well, I'm very happy to do that. And indeed, I will place in spice after this debate the whole list of the conferences subject to uh, uh, confidentiality, but I don't think there's any reason why we can't do that. In particular, I know Ms. Mara will be interested in Dundee. Uh, I was able, in speaking to a business tourism conference earlier today, pre presiding officer, to give an example of a conference that's been won by Dundee in order to attract 600 delegates to, of experts in the addiction field. Uh, an effort that was led by Dr. Alex Baldacino, someone with whom I worked when I was progressing the drug strategy, uh, and they beat off in securing for Dundee and Angus. Next year, presiding officer, 600 delegates, an enormous amount of spend. They beat off other venues such as Cancun uh, and I think Seoul or Beijing. So uh, Dundee and Angus are absolutely succeeding and we want the fund to be further employed all throughout the country, although Glasgow and Edinburgh are taking the lead. Presiding officer, because of success of the bid fund, uh, I'm delighted to announce today that we have secured funding for a new conference bid fund for 1516, ensuring that that support will continue to be available. I can therefore announce that a further £1 million of new money will be available to provide match funding to attract major conferences in Scotland. Signing off, sir. The benefit from the existing spend is already being felt because we have around 20 conferences this year and 20 next year that we would not have secured were it not for the bid fund. In other words, that dividend takes us out to 2024 and the whole business tourism world of meetings, incentives, conferences and exhibitions, the mice market is extremely important to Scotland and I pay tribute to Neil Brownlee and his team who lead the business tourism unit and visit Scotland and do a good job. And I know that many members have a close understanding of these things. But of course, yesterday's trophies now lie on the mantelpiece at the risk of dust gathering. So we have to look forward to tomorrow, presiding officer, and we have to uh, replicate the success in 2014 and look at other ways to ensure that Scotland will be on the world stage. I think Mr McGregor hasn't said anything, but I think he wants to intervene. So. Jamie McGregor. Thank you. Um, I thank the Minister very much for taking intervention. And I agree with him that 2014 has been a wonderful year for Scottish tourism. Um, in Argyle, uh, many of the hotels and businesses have been badly affected by the persistent closures on the A83, which is a gateway route for the West Highlands, uh, due to landslides. And hopefully, um, I notice there will be Barnet, hopefully there will be Barnet consequentials for the 15 billion for roads um, announced by the UK government. Could, in the light of that, could some money be spent to find a good solution for the 83, which would be, would be a big boost for, for tourism in that area? Minister, and I can reimburse you some time. Well, thank you for that reimbursement. Uh, uh, 
Uh, obviously, we do, we do recognise, first of all, the problem with rest and be thankful. It's an extremely serious issue for those in the area, and I'm sure the Transport Minister will, in the event that there are Barnet consequentials in transport, uh, study this and competing applications very closely. As Mr McGregor knows, uh, I very recently had a very pleasant evening and stay in a, a hotel in Oban, whilst others were uh, we're lapping it up in the Politician of the Year Award. I was out there earning an honest crust, presiding officer, and enjoyed the hospitality in Oban and a visit to other parts of uh, Argyll. Presiding officer, the success of the themed years that we've had thus far has encouraged us to set a further programme announced by the First Minister on the 10th of September. Uh, 2015 will be our second year of food and drink and will promote our quality produce. The statistics show that the Last year, food and drink uh, generated uh, is, that food and drink generated as a whole, rather in Scotland in 2012, nearly 14 billion pounds, and this 21% uh, increase was the largest turnover of all of the growth sectors. Two thirds of visitors to Scotland say that the quality of food and drink is a key part of their decision to come back to Scotland, and how different it is, presiding officer. Uh, when, when I was a young man and you were still at school and we were enjoying inferior food and it would be impossible to get a good meal. Now, of course, when was the last time that we had a bad meal in Scotland? The quality of our food has improved immeasurably and whilst there is still more to go, we in, see the rising standards through young people taking an interest in cooking, boys and girls, uh, and uh, the, the, the quality improving. So the year of food and drink is a great... Yes, sir, of course I'll give John way to Mason. Mr Mason. I thank Mr Ewing for giving way. I mean, would you ex join me in expressing some disappointment that some hotel chains and pub chains are not very good at promoting Scottish beer? Minister. Absolutely. I, without any equivocation, I will endorse that and uh, glad that he's made that point. Um, uh, and of course, we will continue with the theme years. 2016 will be the year of innovation architecture and design, presiding officer, to 17 history, heritage and archaeology, with a particular focus on ancestral tourism and 218, the year of the young people. We have set these years in advance because we need a long lead-in time, especially for the American market, uh, and to take full advantage of the hooks that these theme years provide. Uh, but there are also more major events on the way. In 215, we see the Gymnastics World Championships, Orienteering World Championships, Swimming, Judo European and FEI European Inventing Championships. In golf, the Open returns to St Andrews. The Rico Women's 215 British Open will be played at Turnberry, and we have recently confirmed the continuation of the Scottish Open to 220. The Scotland's golf courses, of which there are, I think, nearly 600, offer a tremendous attraction to the world as the home of golf, and everywhere I've gone in the world, people talk fondly of the greens of St Andrews and elsewhere. But of course, tourism gains from events and it gains in many other ways. Uh, for example, marine tourism and cruise lining. The Scottish Government is working with Cruise Scotland to visit Scotland to continue to grow the cruise sector. For example, in 2010... Yes, I will, from Duncan McNeil. Duncan McNeil. We, we, we shared a, a very pleasant visit to uh, the, the gateway to Scotland in, in Inverclyde and Greenock, where we now have many, many uh, cruise liners. And there are, I hope he agrees, that many ways that we can uh, you know, promote that. Uh, certainly, we can steal some of the cruise uh, ships from, from Ireland, and I hope we were able to do that. And, and certainly link in with all of these events to ensure that the cruise companies know in long in advance uh, that the passengers can uh, participate in some of these events and making Scotland a greater attraction. Minister. Well, other than a slight ministerial trevor at endorsing theft, officially on behalf of the Scottish Government, I would entirely endorse Mr McNeill's comments. And I remember that Mr McMillan, I think, also joined us on that day. And what struck me about the success of Greenock was the tremendous uh, cadre of goodwill of the volunteers that day. They were absolutely terrific. I was bowled over by their enthusiasm and commitment to give so much of their time. And the vessels in 2010 were 369 up to 450 this year. That's the cruise liners, presiding officer. And visitors, 268 to 387,000 reported. Uh, in fact, I understand that the cruise liner at Disney Magic, were calling at Kirkwall on the 8th of July, 2015, with around 2,700 passengers, including 950 of cast and crew from Disney, 
to accommodate the interest in the Disney Pixar movie Brave. Uh, so Disney are coming to Scotland. Perhaps Mickey Mouse himself may make an appearance in Scotland. One never knows the presiding officer. But the benefit of Brave is being felt uh, at the parts where other characters don't reach, namely Orkney. But there's a serious point about passport checks. This was raised in Convention of the Highlands and Islands on October 12. Uh, and despite five requests to meet UK ministers to discuss the issue, I've not yet been successful. Uh, but the chief executive, Guy Platten, of the UK uh, Chamber of Shipping commented uh, to us around the Greenock visit, actually, as follows. He said, cruise ships are high-value business, and everywhere else in Europe, they're welcomed. The UK is alone in treating the passengers as suspicious and placing obstacles in their way. The Scottish ports have done a fantastic job of attracting cruise ships, but this is a fiercely competitive market, and for Scotland to compete on an equal footing with destinations overseas, the Home Office needs to stop actively deterring ships from coming. Those are the words of uh, the UK Chamber of Shipping Chief Executive Officer. I really do hope, politics aside, that progress can be made of this, because I do fear it may be impeding the further success of the cruise sector. We welcome, of course, the imminent arrival of responsibility for air passenger duty. Uh, this, of course, will give us an opportunity in Scotland to end what has been a burden which, uh, from 2007, has resulted in £210 million less per annum spent in tourism and 1.2 million fewer visitors. So I hope that there will be a consensus that uh, this is a matter that we should tackle, and no doubt we will hear more about that during the debate. The sector employs 211,000 people, 9% of all jobs, uh, and we work very closely with Scottish Tourism Alliance, uh, who are represented here today with, uh, I believe, Stephen Leckie and Mark Crotho and Judy Ray uh, here today and working at the Conference on Business Tourism this morning. We have never had closer or better re relations with the tourism sector and we've never had stronger and more effective leadership. Uh, I wanted to say a bit about caravan parks, presiding officer. Last Thursday, I attended the British Homes and Holiday Parks Association annual conference. And at that conference, research was announced, brand new research, which said this, that in the 12 months leading to October this year, visitors to Scottish holiday parks spent a total of £700 million in the Scottish economy, uh, supporting nearly 13,000 full-time jobs. I think uh, in mentioning this, I do so because I think perhaps there's a risk that the caravan parks, the holiday homes sector, has not really received the credit it deserves, presiding officer, so I hope to put that right. Uh, presiding officer, I think I'm perhaps, uh, even with reimbursement, uh, running out of time, and therefore I won't read the seven or eight other pages that I've got in front of me. I will keep them for later, so please do cope with the suspense uh, manfully. Uh, uh, but if I may conclude by saying it has been a year where Scotland Welcome, welcome the world, and as Shona Robinson put it, she said 2014 was a year to remember, 2015 will be a year to succeed. Thank you, and I call on Jenny Mara, around nine minutes or so, please. Thank you uh, very much, presiding officer. Can I start, I think, what's going to be a very consensual debate this afternoon uh, by agreeing with uh, the Minister about the success in 2014 and that 2015 is um, very much a year we should start building and using this year as a successful springboard. In many ways, we've proven to ourselves this year exactly the heights and the type of events that, that Scotland can host and host extremely well. And there's no reason why we can't have a bold and ambitious uh, agenda for the future. Can I also start, uh, presiding officer, by welcoming the, uh, the bid fund for, for conferences. I think that uh, public investment is uh, very welcome. Can I also ask the Minister, in his response to my intervention, he said he would publish the list of conferences in SPICE. I think that would be very welcome. It would also be of very much interest to me, and I'm sure colleagues across the Chamber, if he would also publish where uh, the, the, the previous fund was spent, where that investment went, so we can check that the dividends are being felt uh, in communities right across this country. 
Presiding officer, I am especially pleased to be opening this debate in this week uh, because it is the week that my home city of Dundee um, was given the stupendous and incredible news uh, just this week that has been awarded its title as a UNESCO uh, City of Design. Dundee is one of only 12 cities globally to hold this City of Design title and it is the first city in the United Kingdom to be awarded this title. And this new status, presiding officer, I think rewards the people of Dundee who have worked tirelessly across a number of sectors to pioneer design through biomedical research, the discovery of the P53 cancer suppressor gene, a design in itself, a growing video games industry, creative technologies and the cherished institutions in many ways that sparked creativity that are the Beano and the Dandy. Recognition of the creative excellence of Dundee is so valuable because it enforces its potential as a city of investment and because it gives confidence to those endeavouring to advance design within our city and it puts our city on the map for tourists within Scotland and outside of Scotland. Presiding officer, reflecting on how the tourism legacy of 2014 has otherwise impacted Dundee, I look to the development, the continued development of the Victoria and Albert Museum, which I know the Minister supports, which will be a great contribution to Scotland's artistic and digital and design attractions, pooling in visitors, I think, from international locations and solidifying our city's name as a place to visit. And these achievements and this growing sector highlights the importance, I think, of tourism to our country. Not only does tourism allow us to connect with wider communities, it gives us the chance to reflect on what makes our cities, towns, villages and countryside so great. We are never in a more privileged position than when we have to reflect on our home communities when we are showing round visitors, international and visitors from other parts of the United Kingdom, telling them what is great and worth visiting um, about our towns and cities, telling them where to go and shop, telling them where to eat, and telling them where they should go and enjoy themselves. Presiding officer, across Scotland, 2014 saw sports tourism dramatically increased by the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup, two magnificent successes. Glasgow 2014 has been hailed as the standout games in the history of the movement by Commonwealth Games Federation Chief Executive Mike Hooper. My colleague Patricia Ferguson will expand on the games. But areas across the country benefited from the Commonwealth Games, with shooting events taking place at Barry Budden Military Base in Carnoustie, to the diving at the Royal Commonwealth Pool in Edinburgh and the triathlon at Strathclyde Country Park in Lanarkshire. It also helped enrich the wider tourism sector, with a Glasgow 2014 survey suggesting that one in ten spectators intended to combine visiting the Games with a longer trip to other parts of Scotland. And the Minister rehearsed the figures from the Ryder Cup which were um, impressive, 45,000 spectators from 75 countries attending, with more than a quarter of a million visitors over the course of the week. Presiding officer, arts and cultural tourism were successful across Scotland in 2014 also, with another outstanding Edinburgh International and Edinburgh Fringe Festival and Glasgow hosting the 20th MTV Europe Music Awards, which were expected to boost the city's economy by up to £10 million. And of course, this weekend will host the BBC Sports Personality of the Year. And I'm sure the Minister won't mind me saying that this, was an, this is an added boost of remaining part of the United Kingdom. Of course, none of these great successes in tourism during 2014 could have been achieved without a sound infrastructure serving tourists from within and without Scotland. But I do think, and I think the Minister would agree with me, that we still have to improve that infrastructure. We had a debate just a few weeks ago in this chamber about our infrastructure allowing a quality of access to Scotland's tourist attractions. And I think there was widespread agreement that we still need to make great leaps in that area. And that, only, that not only means providing the right facilities for disabled people, 
but it could mean capitalising on the energy of the Ryder Cup by improving facilities for school children to learn and play golf and expand opportunities to all of our communities. On traditional infrastructure, presiding officer, the upgrade and duelling of the A9, I think, will have a massive impact on travel tourism for Perthshire and beyond into the Highlands. Uh, perhaps the imperative being road safety, but nevertheless, we will, um, I think, really open up the gateway into, into the Highlands and boost that economy. Can I also say, uh, presiding officer, from um, a, a climate change and um, integrated transport perspective as well, I do think the uh, minister uh, needs to join up, if, if he's not already doing so, with the transport minister on making sure that rail pricing is uh, fair and equitable and as cheap as possible under the new franchise. Because I, I'm, I don't know if the minister will remember, I myself ran a campaign on rail prices on the intercity route and we discovered that at New Year last year the price of a peak ticket return uh, from Dundee to Glasgow was £50.50 and, and I'm sure the Minister would agree with me that that kind of pricing um, does really not uh, boost the, the, the tourism sector. Um, thankfully, the, the First Minister, uh, Alex Hammond, at the time stepped in and reduced this pricing, but there are still anomalies across, um, across the country, and we need to make sure that visitors are able to get around this country at a fair and reasonable price, and not a price that is actually half the price of a hotel room. That brings me on to the pricing of accommodation as well, presiding officer. Sorry, presiding officer, can I just check how long I have? You have around uh, nine minutes. Okay, thank you. Mid-range holiday accommodation for those earning a middle income I think is especially important to look at. And um, at a meeting I had with Highlands and Islands Enterprise, um, they, they pointed out to me that although the, that perhaps the high end or more expensive accommodation uh, sector in the Highlands is very successful, um, there's perhaps a lack of mid-ranged priced um, accommodation. I think we touched on this issue in the equality uh, tourism debate as well, that we must make sure that our tourism sector is um, available to not just international visitors, but those people within our own country looking um, for um, a holiday that will enhance their, their family life and their own quality of life, but that is affordable. And I think there is perhaps a lack of this mid-range um, accommodation uh, in Scotland. The Lonely Planet uh, tour guide reviews, it says, um, accommodation in Scotland is pricey and more so in Edinburgh, Glasgow and Aberdeen than the rest of the country. The only real bargains are the many excellent museums and galleries that you can visit for free. So I think, presiding officer, not only does mid-range accommodation um, provide a greater pool to a wider spectrum of visitors, it's also more likely to contribute back into tourism in Scotland. Presiding officer, I, I welcome the debate today. Labour is happy to support the government's motion and we look forward to building on the success of 2014 with infrastructure, a spread of different budget accommodation and a focus on equality to grow our tourism sector even further in the future. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call in Mudjo Fraser. I can give you around seven minutes or so. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I uh, welcome uh, this debate? from the Scottish Government on the successes achieved for tourism in Scotland in 2014. And as is, this is the uh, first debate I think the Minister has led since the uh, reshuffle, can I congratulate him on retaining his role in government, keeping his head whilst all about were losing theirs. I like to think it was the kind words of the uh, Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee what done it. And I would agree with uh, the Minister, in fact, I agree with uh, nearly all of what he had to say, that this has been a great year for Scotland. And throughout the years, we've heard there was a series of events to showcase Scotland to the world. We had the Europhone coming in 2014, we had Bannockburn Live, the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, an undoubted success with a large world audience. But perhaps most successful of all was the Ryder Cup at Glen Eagles in September, where we were also able to conjure up some fine Scottish weather to highlight the Perthshire setting. And I know that uh, from local traders I've spoken to that a large number of visitors from the USA and Europe extended their stay either side of the Ryder Cup uh, weekend to visit uh, the local area and of course spend some money and some 
took advantage of the opportunity to play on the excellent golf courses uh, in the vicinity and indeed uh, further afield. And of course the legacy from seeing these scenes of Scotland broadcast around the world is one we can build on uh, in the future. And of course we also had the, uh, the referendum in September. Now anecdotally I heard from many tourist operators that they saw a fall in visitors from the rest of the UK immediately prior to the referendum, perhaps people concerned about the political climate, but immediately after the no vote, visitor numbers quickly bounced back. Now, the National Tourist Agency Visit Scotland often comes in for a more than its fair share of criticism in this chamber and elsewhere, but I would have to give credit where it is due. I think it has done an excellent job this year in highlighting Scotland to the world, and I don't, don't just say that because the chair, Dr Mike Cantley, is sitting in the gallery. But there still remain challenges in the tourist sector, and perhaps the greatest challenge is the one of skills. There is still a perception that much work in the tourist sector, particularly in hospitality, is low paid, low skilled and seasonal. When we visit many other countries where tourism is an important part of the economy, we find a different story where careers in tourism are highly prized. And this is perhaps the one area where I think the Scottish Government needs to focus its future efforts. When you travel around Scotland, you visit hotels and restaurants and other establishments, very often the young people serving will be people from Eastern Europe or elsewhere in the Commonwealth. And it's very hard to attract many of our young people into careers in the industry. And I think to encourage them in, we need to look at what we can do to improve standards and improve training opportunities. This is an area where industry, colleges and government need to be working closely together. And I think if I was to give one message to the Minister from this debate about the future, I think that is the area that is most important, and I'm sure members uh, who are involved in the industry would, would agree with that. Now, it's not been possible to have a debate on tourism in recent years, either in this chamber or in committee or elsewhere, without the issue of air passenger duty being raised. We've heard for years concern expressed from the industry that this is holding back the number of visitors to Scotland by air, although, of course, visitor numbers at our main airports have, in fact, continued to grow. And certainly the Scottish Government are on record sharing the view that APD is a problem. The Minister has quoted a study by York Aviation, which was, was produced in October 2012, claiming the figure of £210, £210 million less per annum being spent in Scotland by uh, visitors uh, uh, compared to what uh, it, it would have been the case had APD remained at the same level it was in 2007, and other members of the government, including the former First Minister, have expressed a similar view. And in this, the Scottish Conservatives agree. We've made it absolutely clear that we agree with that. We believe that the rate of APD is holding back the growth of tourism in Scotland. And for that reason, we particularly welcome, uh, as all of us in this chamber should, that the Smith Commission uh, have recommended that APD will be devolved, and the Treasury have agreed to this. So now we know that the devolution of APD will happen, we need to move on from discussing whether we should have this power to discussing what we will do with it when we get it. And we on this side of the chamber are quite clear that APD needs to be reduced or eliminated as quickly as possible. Now in the Scottish Government's white paper, they said that in the event of independence, APD would be reduced by 50% in the next Parliament. Now, of course, the vote wasn't for independence, so that is, of course, no longer uh, relevant as the policy. And indeed, had the vote been for independence, that would only have taken place at any point within the next six years. So we could have been in a situation where that rate of APD that we currently have applied for another six years, despite all we've heard about its deleterious effects. So today I'm, I'm calling on the Scottish Government to set out their plans for APD today. If it is as pernicious as the Minister has claimed, I assume the Government will want to set out at a very early stage what their intentions are. And I listened very carefully to what the Minister said earlier in his contribution, but it fell short of any firm commitment. And I appreciate it's not been long since the Smith Commission report, but I do think we need to know as soon as possible, and people in the industry need to know as soon as possible what exactly the government is proposing and what the time scale, timetable for this will be. And I know that SNP members during this debate will join with me in calling for an early announcement about APD reduction. They have uh, continuously raised this issue over a whole 
uh, series of previous years claiming uh, APD is a huge problem. Well, now it is in the Scottish Government's gift. It is up to the Scottish Government to act, and I hope they will live up to the rhetoric uh, of the previous years. But let me close simply on a consensual note and agree uh, with the Minister. Uh, 2014 was a good year for Scotland. We have a springboard to build on for coming years, and I think we can all be unanimous in support of the Scottish Government's motion today and indeed of the future of this vital industry. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Could I remind members who wish to participate that they should press the request to speak buttons? Many thanks. I call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Alex Riley. Speeches of around six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm very pleased to take part in what I believe is a hugely important debate on tourism today. We'll rightly hear and have heard a lot of praise in the Chamber this afternoon about why 2014 was such a hugely successful and stunning year for Scotland and for our tourism industry in particular. Let me say this, the time of this debate could not be more appropriate as we're in the middle of the budget process in this parliament, because I believe the reality of the challenges facing industry in future might be about to bite, and potentially bite hard. I'll expand upon that, what I mean later in my contribution this afternoon. But let's first remind ourselves of the sheer scale and value of the Scottish tourism sector in Scotland. 20,000 tourism businesses generating 15 million in overnight stays and 4.6 billion pounds per annum of value to the Scottish economy. An industry directly employing around 211,000 people and accounting for 8.1% of Scotland's total workforce. The success of our tourism industry and its vital role in ensuring a successful Scottish economy cannot therefore be doubted. And in terms of exposure on the world stage and domestically, during 2014, our tourism products soared to new heights. Of course, we may have to wait a, a little bit to see what the full year impact was on visitor numbers. The highlights have already been well spoken about. A stunning and successful Commonwealth Games, presenting Scotland on the world stage as an incredibly inclusive, friendly and hospitable place to visit. 690,000 Games visitors, 220,000 Games visitors out with Scotland. And the marvellous sporting spectacle, the Ryder Cup, with a media backdrop shops from the Glen Eagles that were truly breathtaking, showcasing our country's fantastic natural beauty. And I've heard other figures spoken about this afternoon that my brief tells me there were 250,000 fans from 96 different countries. On top of that, they've had events like the MTV's Global Awards show, which attracted over 700 million households watching that in Glasgow on the 9th of November. Each event on its own, providing a global market and exposure that money simply cannot buy, demonstrating that all is best about our country. In my own constituency, for a moment of Stirling, President Officer, a signature event of the second homecoming year was Bannockburn Live, an event which surpassed expectations and blew its critics out of the water. 20,000 people attended Bannockburn Live, with 10% coming from overseas. There was a real buzz on the day, and the event was an enormous success. This was part of a wide-ranging programme of events in Stirling, including National Armed Forces Day, a whisky festival, Stirling Fringe, a paranormal festival, and many other locally organised events. But one of the real highlights was the amazing pipe fest march through the ancient city that thrilled locals and visitors from all over the globe alike. Now, I know many of my own NSP colleagues, and some have done it already, will want their own events um, to, to highlight. Uh, that's, uh, that's all helped what's ever been going on in Scotland to have a champagne year for Scottish tourism. Yes, champagne tourism year that truly bubbled with excitement. The challenge now is how to keep this crucial industry fizzing in future because I believe the challenges it faces are potentially significant. The Minister is right. We need to look for the future. We need to take steps now to ensure that Scottish tourism industry builds on its undoubted success of 2014. And it's vital that we're well placed to weather any future economic downturn and squeeze on visitor spending power, particularly given the prevailing economic conditions in the European Union. Therefore, we need to be in a position to increase effort to boost visitor numbers, both for traditionally strong markets and new and developing markets. 
So I have four personal challenges I want to set out in my contribution to this debate. Firstly, to the tourism industry itself. Redouble your efforts to become as efficient and customer friendly as possible. Look afresh at any potential new capital investments you are considering and bring them forward now if your balance sheet allows. To look again at your marketing and examine where best you can improve and strengthen your performance. Secondly, to the UK Government, like Murdo Fraser, accelerate the devolution of air passenger duty at this vital time to put the Scottish tourism product at a competitive advantage and enable the potential for more direct air routes into Scotland. Thirdly, to the Scottish Government, look again at the budget allocation for Visit Scotland. Examine whether additional financial resources can be found to enable them to increase their marketing capacity and direct Scottish enterprise and Highlands and Islands enterprise to focus more of their activity and actions on the tourism sector. Now, we know we get a fantastic return from the public money that Visit Scotland spends, but now is the time to strike and secure the greatest marketing dividend possible, building on that champagne year that was 2014. And fourthly, a challenge to all of my own MSP colleagues to join me on a new cross-party group on tourism, which I emailed colleagues about on Friday. Such a group can act as a political focal point for the industry. It's a surprise to me, actually, when I actually looked at it, that one doesn't exist already. The cross-party group drawing partners together at a parliamentary level, helping to facilitate discussion and recommending action on how best this vital industry can keep its fizz and rise to the challenges of the future. Thank you, Mr. Second Officer. Many thanks. I now call on Alex Shirley to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Presiding officer, I also welcome um, the debate and would want to acknowledge the hard work and commitment that the Minister Fergus Ewan puts into um, driving the tourist industry in Scotland. Certainly when I was a council leader, uh, Fergus Ewan wrote to me and came along to a meeting in Fife, asked for the meeting, came along to the meeting with officials um, to try and impress on Fife Council the opportunities for business tourism and I, I, I was appreciative of the hard work that, that he does. A report by Deloitte in November 2013 set out that tourism should play a fundamental role in job creation and the economic growth within Scotland over the next decade. And that report, Tourism, Jobs and Growth, um, said that Scotland could grow its tourism by 53.4 per cent by 2025. It also set out that the tourism economy was worth about £11.6 billion in 2013, uh, the equivalent of 10.3 per cent of uh, Scotland's GDP, and that uh, Scotland could have a tourism industry worth £23.1 by 2020. Um, 25. And I highlight those figures because I think this is an area where I agree with Bruce Crawford more work needs to be done, but it is an area that has grown and there is real opportunity there. And I think that really raises a number of questions for me in terms of how we move forward. Um, I certainly am somebody who enjoys holidaying in Scotland and spend most of my holidays in the Highlands. And I take up Jenny Mara's point earlier about, about costs. And there's a lot of Scots uh, that, that would enjoy spending more time in Scotland and seeing what our beautiful country is like. But So I do think like looking at the kind of provision that's there, talking to to those and encouraging those who can invest in different uh, provision so that cost is not a barrier to people to be able to holiday in Scotland. People often say to me, you know, you're mad, you would be cheaper going abroad to the sun. Um, and, and, you know, so we need to address that. I think also in terms of, Murdo Fraser raised the point, but I want to raise it again, is in terms of what the opportunities are for Scotland from tourism, um, particularly around jobs skills and training and we need to look I think because there is that perception that is there. I remember a couple of years ago speaking to the manager at the, the Old Course Hotel in St Andrews and talking to him about the opportunities to try and get people, younger people, 
um, to be able to see where the industry was going. And he was telling me about, about the real opportunities that are within that industry. I know the Queen Margaret University, along with Scottish Enterprise, were, were running a course with hotels in the Edinburgh area where young people were getting the opportunity part-time work when still at school and being able to see what that industry was like, because it is an industry of hard work, but there is opportunities there. So we need to maximise those opportunities um, so that, that people in our communities and communities across Scotland can take the real advantages that come from tourism. And that's not to take away, um, again, Murdo Fraser made the point that as you, as you tour around the Highlands and you use different, different um, facilities, there are a lot of people that come from the rest of Europe and elsewhere and get jobs in, in Scotland um, and are hard workers and, and make a valuable contribution. But we need to try and impress that there are opportunities for our uh, people in our, our schools, etc. We have high levels of youth unemployment and high levels of employ unemployment that are unacceptable. So we need to take the, grow the jobs. We also need to look at how we plan. It's not just about, about um, Visit Scotland, although they play an important role. It's also about looking at how we work with local authorities, um, community planning partners, for example, the city region agenda, because Edinburgh at certain points in the year, Edinburgh um, just can't accommodate the, the amount of tourists that are actually there. And in terms of the streets, and you, you, have, you have Fife, you have the Lothians, East Lothian, you have all these other tourist destinations. And by working together, um, so that, that in the summer months when, when, when Edinburgh is absolutely packed, we can actually get people and encourage people um, to, to get across to Fife, to the historic capital, Dunfermline, and to, to other, other areas. And, and so we spread, if you like, um, the, the wealth that's coming into the area, rather than it being focused on specifically um, areas such as, as Edinburgh, which is a massive attraction. I often say that in, in, in terms of Fife, um, Visit Scotland, I was fairly critical uh, of over a number of years because they thought Fife was St Andrews or St Andrews was Fife. And my argument was always that, that St Andrews in many ways can mark it itself. But, you know, we have the rest of Fife. Fife's outdoor activities, we have uh, one of the highest visitor attractions for outdoors in the whole of Scotland. The coastal path um, that, that takes you right, right round Fife um, is, 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 is something that if you've not tried, you certainly should. But then that raises questions again, because how do we actually support the growth of the SMEs um, so that if, if people are coming to enjoy areas like Fife and elsewhere, how do we support local business um, so that you can establish more facilities and create more visitors coming to a place and coming back, more importantly, um, by, by the experience that they have. So there is major opportunities that could be taken again in terms of supporting the, the growth of, of the tourist um, sector in areas that are not normally perhaps seen as, as, as those areas that are, that are um, most, most where most tourists would go. Murdo Fraser mentions the air traffic passenger duty, and I would agree um, with him that we need to see the government come forward and say what they're going to do in terms of that power. But I would also ask the minister to look at other opportunities. In my own constituency, there is the, the port of Resyth. Um, and we had um, a ferry running from, from Resyth into Europe, a passenger ferry, and that was not able to be sustained. I would, I would very much welcome, and I have raised this in the European um, and External Affairs Committee, a look at all transport links in and out of Scotland and see if there are opportunities, for example, from the port of Resyth. But in conclusion, um, presiding <laughs> officer, I see my time's up. In conclusion, there is real opportunities here, but let's look at how we work in partnership with local authorities to ensure that our communities can take the advantage and, and, and everybody share in the wealth that can come from tourism. Many thanks. I now call Joan McAlpine to be followed by John Mees. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome this afternoon's debate on such an important aspect of the Scottish economy and I'm delighted to be taking part in it. 2014, as other members have noted, has indeed been the year that Scotland welcomed the world from our largest city, hosting the most successful Commonwealth Games ever 
and Glen Eagles welcoming the Ryder Cup. In addition to that, we've had a fantastic programme of Year of Homecoming events highlighting the, culture, the country's great cultural offerings from as far apart as Newton Stewart to Stromness. The Minister uh, mentioned the plaudits given to our country by the Lonely Planet Guide. Um, the rival to Lonely Planet is, of course, Rough Guide, and they matched those plaudits by comparing Glasgow to the carnival capital of the world, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, 2014 continues to be a fantastic year, of course, for Scottish tourism, and I think it's particularly important to pay tribute, as others have, to the swathes of volunteers, as well as the people of Glasgow, who made the Commonwealth Games such a tremendous success and really did Scotland proud. Uh, an equally impressive Ryder Cup leaves us with absolutely no doubt that Scotland raised the bar in delivering major sporting events. We now have the capacity to deliver and the credibility that comes with success. And it means that we can continue to be ambitious and bid for such events in future. Uh, we were speaking about the Smith Commission earlier today, and um, I think it's uh, appropriate um, to welcome uh, some of the powers um, proposed by the Smith Commission, which are linked to tourism. And in particular, one that hasn't been mentioned already is an allocation of VAT. I would like to have seen a full allocation of VAT. Um, but um, still, all, nevertheless, welcome the partial allocation because I think in tourism in particular, um, if we get the benefit of uh, the investment that we make to attract people to these, this country, um, we can uh, reap that in VAT revenues. And the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee had a very pleasant evidence session in August this year when the Parliament was sitting in August and we took evidence from festivals um, in uh, the festivals in Edinburgh, um, which included get going out to, to see um, some of the, the, the performances on offer. But in the evidence session afterwards, uh, Festivals Edinburgh talked about, um, talked about perhaps uh, increasing revenue by putting additional taxes on, on uh, hotel rooms, which is something that had been looked at in the past. Um, and I made the point that, you know, if they were able to uh, benefit directly from the money raised through taxes that, that already come in in response to the festival, uh, that would be a, a far better solution. Um, and it's worthwhile pointing out that the Edinburgh Festival is like having a Commonwealth Games every single year uh, in terms of the revenue that it generates. And I also welcome the recommendations by the Smith Commission to devolve, the, to devolve the responsibility for air passenger duty to the Scottish Parliament, although it has been a long time coming, um, and still we wait. It, it cannot come quick enough. Um, the, by reducing APD, we will be able to incentivise more direct travel, both to and from Scotland, uh, where at the moment passengers face some of the highest levels of taxation in Europe. Uh, however, Notwithstanding that, um, I would uh, encourage uh, development of transport links within Scotland as well as those which bring an increased number of people to Scotland. Uh, Dumfries and Galloway um, in my south of Scotland constituency uh, depends greatly on tourism uh, for its income. Around 5,300 people are employed in the sector across Dumfries and Galloway and contributes, to, contributes an estimated 68-point million gross value added to the local authority area. Um, however, um, it is often said that the area remains something of a hidden gem because of the difficulties in uh, transport links uh, connecting the Fries and Galloway to other areas of central Scotland. And we can only look enviously at the duelling of the A9 or the east to the borders rail link and hope that our turn will eventually come. While giving evidence to the Economy, Culture and Tourism Committee in October, Malcolm Roughhead, CEO of Visit Scotland, agreed with me that Dumfries and Galloway does suffer due to its ge geographical location, in particular the lack of electrified train lines and poor road links. Um, can lead it to uh, not attracting the number of visitors that it deserves. Um, however, notwithstanding that, the figures do show that in 2013, 
Gretna Green's famous blacksmith shop hosted a staggering 761,000 visitors, and Galloway Forest Park um, attracted over 423,000 visitors. Uh, the area is a leader in cultural tourism, um, which I have always tried to encourage and spring fling Scotland's premier arts and craft tourism festival, inviting people into artist studios, takes place in the whole of De Vries and Galloway each year in May. Uh, and it includes big name artists and recent graduates and is widely acknowledged as uh, one of the leading events of its kind. And as well as cultural tourism, I was pleased to be told that uh, by a recent visit to um, Scottish Enterprise that they were looking at uh, developing agri-tourism, which has been very successful in other parts of Europe. And I think given our uh, food and drink successes, could be a great success um, in the southwest of Scotland and other areas of Scotland. So in conclusion, presiding officer, um, I would like to uh, welcome again this debate and hope that future years uh, of tourism in Scotland are as successful as the one that we're celebrating just now. Thank you. Many thanks. I call John Mason to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. And I think there's clearly a huge amount of good news around tourism this year. Uh, for us in the east end of Glasgow, we have had the Commonwealth Games, although I accept that they did go slightly beyond that. And I myself was uh, volunteering at the SACC as a Clydesider, as was uh, Patricia Ferguson, who I'm sure we're going to hear from uh, later. And both the official reports of the Games and my own experience say that it went extremely well. In fact, any complaints I heard tended to be from Glaswegians who were unable to use their usual routes around the SECC or elsewhere, whereas those from further afield seemed entirely positive. In the East End itself, we have seen the venues and athletes' village directly linked to the Games and now available for wider use. I understand the village will start receiving permanent residents in January, and the venues continue to see community use as well as spectator events like Glasgow Rocks basketball in the Emirates Arena. Less directly linked to the Games have been infrastructure improvements throughout the Clyde Gateway area, covering part of both my and Rutherglen constituencies. Things like the M74 completion, Domarnock Station and the East End Regeneration Route are the obvious examples and can certainly benefit tourists as well as everyone else. But the decontamination of land is also hugely important for the longer term, although very expensive and I think currently about halfway through. On Friday, I attended the Clyde Gateway Urban Regeneration Company's annual meeting, and it is good to hear of the Scottish Government and the two councils, Glasgow and South Lanarkshire, working together on funding all of this. And I certainly hope that commitment uh, can continue. Specifically on tourism, I would like to see more in the way of hotels and restaurants in the east end of Glasgow. I do believe there is a need and a market for these, not least because we have Celtic Park and other sports facilities, all of which now attract sizable numbers of visitors from a wide area. The west and the south of Glasgow have quality hotels and restaurants, and I would like to see this developing in the East End too. Another aspect of Glasgow tourism which I feel we have not cracked is camping. This may not be everyone's cup of tea, but some of us want a holiday spending less on accommodation and more available for meals, drinks and visiting attractions. Last time I was in Dublin, I stayed at an excellent campsite which was served by a regular bus service into the city centre, and I believe there is a demand in our cities too for this kind of facility. Having mentioned camping, can I say what a good holiday I had this year on Call and Tyree? I suspect I was meant to be out campaigning and not having a holiday. However, I did, I did feel reassured when I met John Swinney and his family on the ferry between the two islands. Both islands, I have to say, are very acceptable campsites, although it also has to be said that Cole's campsite was extremely quiet. For me, this raises the question of whether we could do more to encourage people in Scotland to take holidays in Scotland. I still meet people who have never been north of Perth and never been to an island. At the end of secondary one, a couple of our school teachers took a group of us on a trip round the Highlands. I still remember one of them repeatedly saying beforehand, Quote, this will be the best 10 days of your little lives, unquote. Well, even if it was not the best 10 days, it was certainly extremely good. Surely we should be trying to ensure that every youngster has a school trip in Scotland during their time at secondary school. Continuing on the subject of islands, the Finance Committee had an excellent meeting in Arden yesterday. Not surprisingly, tourism came up strongly in our workshops with local business leaders, HIE, council and others we met. A few points particularly struck me from the, my 24 hours in the island, 
and I think they could be relevant for Scotland as a whole. One, the local organisations seem to be working very well together. For example, in the hotel, the shower gel was made by a local company, Aran Aromatics. They are, secondly, they are deliberately targeting the top end of the market, knowing they cannot compete at the cheap and cheerful end. Thirdly, they have managed to expand the tourist season to up to about 40 weeks, offering cheaper accommodation at this time of year, but still making money from food, drink and other sales. Fourthly, currently most visitors to Arden are from the south and west of Scotland, but they see the growth areas as being from overseas and are aiming specifically to target that. And fifthly, they're also looking at their areas of weakness, for example, a lack of marinas. Eh, as elsewhere, clearly, eh, yachts are popular on the Clyde and the west coast of Scotland, but there are very few places in Arden where you can actually, actually get your yacht alongside. And yet visitors from yachts spend eh, a considerably higher amount of money than most people. Also yesterday, I was struck by Visit Scotland's study for European Tourism Day, suggesting that people from different countries find different things attractive about Scotland. For example, I see in the Herald that Germans enjoy hill walking, while the French like our food, the Spanish are keen to explore Scotland's cultural landmarks, and Italians like the cool climate, and most Dutch visitors simply enjoy the atmosphere. Now, I don't think we want to be too stereotypical when we go down that route, and a certain amount of humour is probably needed in there as well. But it does show that our cooler, damper climate is actually very attractive for Italians and others who find their own summers a bit too hot. Finally, food and drink deserves a particular mention. As I think Bruce Crawford said, it represents some 18% of our overseas exports. And that's also an attraction for tourists coming to Scotland as they get to visit production sites and sample goods near their place of origin. Now, I do personally have to say that uh, drink has tended to be rather dominated by whisky, uh, and I accept that it's extremely important, but I personally do not like whisky. Uh, but we do have a very good range of beers, and perhaps we should get a little bit more excited about them. On Sunday evening in Arden, I was drinking Arden Blonde, uh, and in the east end of Glasgow, we have the excellent West Microbrewery. However, here in Parliament and in some hotels, uh, we insist on in providing wine from elsewhere at our receptions, and I think we could do a little bit harder to promote our own close, products. I think that is both what tourists and other visitors would like. Thank you. Many thanks. Now call on Hanzala Malik to be followed by Chick Brody. Uh, six minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. Glaswegians have earned a reputation of being the friendliest people in the world, and the Labour administration has succeeded in putting Glasgow on the world map as the first tourist destination for Scotland, led by Councillor Gordon Matheson. Glasgow's hotel sector continues its unprecedented growth, driven by major events and conferences businesses attract to the city. Average hotel occupation in Glasgow for the financial year, date April to October, stands at over 88%, a 4% increase in last year's hotel Occupation in Scotland is strongest in Glasgow. The city is also on power with London as a strong, strong, in, strong in Europe, outperforming Amsterdam, Barcelona, Copenhagen, uh, Hamburg, Paris, Prague, Rome, and Vienna. And that's saying some cities. As a result of this constant growth, interest now grows in Glasgow as a safe city. Hotel developers have shown continuous confidence in, this, in Glasgow, which will add more than 800 new hotel rooms in Glasgow's stock in 2015. Hotel uh, occupied during the Commonwealth Games, Glasgow hotels achieved an average occupation of 95.3%, reflecting on 11.2% increase on the same period in 2013. Major events in 2014 and thereafter, Glasgow has hosted numerous high performance events in 2014, including the best ever Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, the BBC Radio One's Big Weekend, the largest free ticket music festival in Europe, the MTV European Music Awards, the opening concert for the Riders' Cup, and 
and later this month, the city will host the BBC Sports Personality of the Year Award and the just, just Gymnastics World Cup. The global spotlight has been on Glasgow this year and never before have we attracted so much. A TV audience of more than two million people provides an unprecedented opportunity to showcase Glasgow to the world. The Commonwealth Games have cemented a lasting legacy in the shape of a number of high profile major events, conferences, continues to grow the Glasgow throughout the two, uh, up to 2001, including uh, events which will take place. Uh, for example, the, the European Judo Championships, the Turner Prize, the World Irish Dancing Championships. From 2016 to 2021, World Pipe Band Championships, European Swimming Championships, just some examples of what Glasgow is attracting. The success of the Games has also reaffirmed Glasgow's position as number eight in the world's top 10. Glasgow is one of the best equipped and most successful conference destinations in Europe with an award-winning event bureau, which has claimed the title of the UK's best conference bureau for the record-breaking eight consecutive years Sports City Awards. Bureau tourists secured by Glasgow City Marketing Bureau, that's GCMB, since its encapsulation in 2005 has been worth more than one billion to the city's economy. It's currently led by Chief Executive Scott Taylor, who's done a marvelous job so far. More than 2,200 2, domestic and international conferences have been brought to the city over the past eight years. This equates to more than 800,000 conferences, conference delegates spending 3.3 million nights in the city's hotels during that time. Glasgow has hosted 435 conferences in the last financial year, April 13, 2013 to March 2014, delivering 118 million to the local economy to benefit from. A tremendous record, a record that this quite clearly demonstrates that Glasgow has shown the way to the rest of Scotland and hopefully will continue to do so. There are many other examples of uh, conferences that will be attracted to the city. For example, conferences like the International Bible Study Association. And they're hoping to have 8,500 8, delegates and it is anticipated that 13 million will impact on the economy. Other examples like all energy exhibition and conference, 7,000 delegates expected to come, anticipated 4.7 million economic impact. European Association of International Education, 4,500 delegates, an impact of 7.3 million to the city. I can go on, the list is very, very favorable. And all I really want to say, a lasting legacy, not at all. It is a legacy that we will continue to build on. A successful year, not at all. We intend to continue to build on this. And most of all, I would like to thank all the various community groups, organizations, agencies, local authorities, and everybody else who's played a very important role in all of this success story. But one needs to recognize the, the, the captains that I've already mentioned who've played a very successful role in this. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Thank you. I now call on Chuck Grody to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. As I was saying, or trying to say, to the Presiding Officer in the Chamber at the end of his speech last week, it was Chekhov who said, if you cry forward, you must, without fail, make plain in what direction you wish to go. This, of course, applies to most everything, but especially to that key sector of the Scottish economy, tourism. In what direction do we wish to travel? In what direction do we want to take our friends, our visitors? But before we do that, let's look back briefly. My love and my commitment to the game of golf could allow me to wax lyrical for days, I won't, uh, about not just the amphitheatre that was Glen Eagles, the artistry, the greenery of the surrounding hills, the course itself, but of course, it was much more than that. It was about the, the colour and the life that uh, Americans and Europeans alike brought together 
uh, to that golfing uh, coliseum. It is a golfing legacy that will live, I believe, for a long, long time. That is until it returns to the home of golf, hopefully in the short term rather than the longer term. And of course, in the meantime, the Opens will compensate uh, for that. Deputy Presiding Officer, the optimal economic TNS report just at the end of last month on the visitor impact study of the Commonwealth Games underlined the impact of the sport legacy that the Games brought to Scotland. So it's right, uh, as I do, pay tribute to Visit Scotland, the Glasgow City Marketing Bureau, Glasgow City Council, and the Tourism Alliance and all the others involved in managing and contribu contributing to this massive success. There's a great marketing adage which says a brand that has a story to tell has meaning and a brand that has meaning has impact and resonance. Well, we all know the impact and resonance the Games had, so we must have told a very good story. 690,000, almost 0.7 million visitors, equivalent to 15% of Scotland's population. Unique visitors attended events related to Glasgow 2014 and Festival 2014. 93% rated Scotland a good place uh, to visit. On average, each visitor spent £98 per day, a total spend of £282 million, which in three weeks alone represented almost 10% of Scotland's tourism spend only one year before. The homecoming in Bannockburn represented more uh, presiding officer than a financial spend. There was an emotional spend and investment. To those of us who attended Bannockburn, we were overwhelmed by the warmth, the easy and cosy relationship, not just of the locals, but of the kinsmen who, who came from across the globe. Deputy Presiding Officer, how, we cannot, however, rest on our, on our laurels. Global tourism uh, competition is fierce, and the roles of the professionals in Visit Scotland, the Scottish Tourism Alliance, and all the other bodies uh, is key, and, uh, uh, as is the role particularly Visit Scotland and the vast range of tourist organisations uh, related to that, such as ABBA in, in air. Uh, and of course, in accepting all of these things, we do accept the comment that Murdo Fraser made in terms of APD, but it's not just about that. Our global communications and global marketing has to be continually better than our competition. Our customer service and quality has to be better than our competition. Uh, in that context, I pay tribute to some of our young European immigrant colleagues who contributed to that success. Our food and drink is better than competition, and its quality is recognised for its richness. But we have to unlock even more of that richness through innovation and creativity, and I, I draw attention to the work that is done, uh, particularly at Queen Margaret University. Deputy, Pres Deputy Presiding Officer, our great hotels and bars have to accept that we are in this endeavour for the long term and the longer term gains, providing greater aggregate returns than just for the short term. The study reported yesterday by Visit Scotland was wide ranging and appropriate in that it defined and highlighted the many needs of visitors. And, and John Mason referred to those from Germany, uh, from France, from Holland, uh, who like the atmosphere and the sun, the sun. The Italians, they like the cool climate and no sun. And so it goes on, from food to climate, from drink to history, heritage and literature. Yes, even from sun to rain, Scotland has a lot to offer, nothing more so than the, the efforts of its people. As Denise Hall, the head of international marketing at Visit Scotland said, in talking of tourism success, I quote, overall, she said, it is the rich traditions, the landscapes, and above all, the warm welcome of the Scottish people which remains the key. We have a great brand. We have a great story to tell. We have to keep telling it. Aligned with strong global events, cultural and sport, then we, I believe, are in the right place. And as Chekhov said, let's go forward and make it plain in what directions we want our tourist uh, industry to go. It can only be onwards and upwards. Many thanks. I now call on Anne McTaggart to be followed by Stuart McMillan.
Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I would like to thank Fergus Ewan um, on securing time in the Chamber to discuss this issue, as I don't think there is much disagreement um, that 2014 was a great year for tourism in Scotland, and particularly my own city of Glasgow. To contribute to this interesting debate, I would like to thank or to highlight even a few facts, and I am well aware that people have mentioned some of the earlier events, but some are just so important that I will mention again. They have been um, of such benefit and of such value to not just Glasgow, but also to Scotland. During the Commonwealth Games, 690,000 people came to Scotland with the purpose of attending the Games. These guests spent a total of £282 million, which went directly into not only Glasgow's economy, but all of Scotland. In addition, after the Games, one in ten visitors intend intended to combine visiting the Games with an extended trip throughout Scotland, with 40% of the people saying Edinburgh was their top destination although I still think Glasgow's better. Anyway, just from these facts, it could be said that Glasgow and Scotland had a good year from tourism, but fortunately, this is only part of the picture. With the Ryder Cup, we saw a continued pattern of success for the Scottish tourism industry. Throughout the duration of the Cup, more than 250,000 people came out to watch the competition. This crowd comprised of people from over 75 different countries. As part of the successful year of, of events, Glasgow was able to keep up the momentum from the Commonwealth Games by hosting the MTV European Music Awards. By hosting the event, Glasgow was able to promote Scotland and the city itself to over 700 million viewers throughout the world. In the process, Glasgow also experienced an expected economic boost of up to £10 million. It is easy to see from this information that Scotland, and in particular in my home of Glasgow, had a very good year of tourism. What this should highlight is the increasing role of tourism as a means for business and economic benefit in Scotland. A report from Delotti in 2013 noted tourism should play a fundamental role in creating jobs and helping grow the economy in Scotland for the near future. By their predictions, tourism in Scotland stands to grow around 53 per cent by 2025. And the value of our industry could go from £11.6 billion in 2020 13 to 23.1 billion in 2025. From this alone, we should know just how important it is to continue uh, the growth of tourism. As a result, we should be working in all the ways we can to make Scotland a place that people throughout the world visit. Working to help our tourism industry goes far beyond economic gains for the cities of Scotland. It also gives direct benefit to the people of Scotland by creating jobs and putting money into the businesses which are essential for the average person. When a place like Glasgow hosts a major event, the money that comes into the city goes to businesses as diverse as the construction company who builds the new facilities to the pub that attendees go to, to after a long day. Bearing in mind the benefits that come from tourism, both to our national economy and to the wallets of our average Scottish person, we must move into 2015 with the same determination that brought the massive success of 2014. Already we know that Scotland is set to host the 2015 World Championship Games and Artistic Gymnastics, and I'm sure my daughter has booked me in for something this weekend to start that off. But anybody more, more than willing, I'll swap the ticket, no problem. 80 countries for a 10, for, will be over here competing for 10 days of competition. This event is expected to bring £5 million of direct economic benefit to our economy. However, in order for the success of 2014 to be replicated, 
We must hope to have the same level of commitment in the future that the amazing staff and volunteers in the events, hospitality, transport sectors gave throughout 2014. In conclusion, President Officer, based on successes of 2014 and the great prospects for the future, I am happy to support the Government's motion, recognising the phenomenal year for tourism in Scotland and particularly the City of Glasgow. I have no doubts that our future efforts will be as successful as in the past, as we hope we may work together in Parliament to make the most of these amazing opportunities. And it would be remiss of me, presiding officer, not to mention that people make Glasgow. Many thanks. I now call on Stuart McMillan to be followed by Jean Arker. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak uh, today uh, and certainly to express my thoughts uh, about Scotland's tourism offering this year. I also want to add my congratulations to everyone uh, who has actually been involved in making Scotland's tourism offering this year a spectacular success. Uh, we have heard the phrase um, said outside of the, the chamber today. Uh, I'm surprised I've actually not really heard it much inside. But I've heard the phrase of the eyes of the world uh, have been upon us. And they clearly were this year. Uh, I, mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, millions of people across the globe actually were transfixed about the events that were taking place within Scotland. Now, whether it was uh, issues regarding the, uh, the Commonwealth Games or the Ryder Cup uh, or Homecoming Scotland events, as well as the, the independence referendum, our country certainly attracted many people to come and actually visit uh, and to stay, and to certainly and those who actually lived here, to actually come and well, to explore different parts of the country. Uh, now, I know Murdo Fraser touched upon the, the referendum uh, campaign, uh, and certainly I mean, the, the amount of people that came to Scotland, not just media, but others who actually came to Scotland to actually find out a bit more about what was going on, uh, will actually certainly have a, 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 have a greater uh, economic uh, return going forward. Uh, I mean, certainly the, the initial splurge of people coming certainly was, uh, was excellent, but it will have a longer term economic bonus for Scotland, uh, and that certainly can only be a good thing. I think the, the international imagery uh, of our country, uh, certainly particularly with the people of Scotland actually being engaged with the referendum debate, and that international imagery will actually, it will certainly uh, can that spark off even more interest in the country going forward, and it will leave a positive image of Scotland elsewhere. But one of the areas that I do certainly want to focus upon is that of marine tourism. Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, the Commonwealth Games did not actually have sailing or canoeing uh, actually involved in it. Uh, but uh, certainly, as the Chamber will know, I chair the Parliament's cross-party group on uh, recreational boating and marine tourism. And just as a plug, we meet tonight at 6 o'clock, if anyone wants to come along. Uh, and since our cross-party group uh, started in 2009, uh, various reports have actually been published uh, regarding the economic impact of the wider marine tourism offering, whether it's from, uh, from the cruise tourism of Scotland or sailing tourism, uh, to the economic impact of wildlife tourism, uh, as well as the economic impact of recreational sea angling in Scotland. There have been various reports that have been published by various organisations uh, since going back to 2009. Uh, and uh, as a consequence of our cross-party group's marine tourism symposium last year, we embarked upon attempting to get a better understanding and a more robust set of statistics uh, on recreational boating and marine tourism. And thankfully, uh, with the help of public agencies, uh, we, uh, we've managed to uh, get, get the finance and also get the people uh, to actually put together uh, basically kind of, uh, uh, a contract to actually uh, bring this piece of work together. That contract has now been let, uh, and the data collection project, uh, which has been managed by the Firth of Clyde Forum and also the Scottish Government, will be able to utilise the statistics from this year, amongst others, uh, and I'm sure that that will actually help plan the marine tourism industry going forward. And I'm sure that certainly the numbers uh, within the marine tourism industry going forward will, uh, I mean, it will prove to be uh, kind of a great success. I, I firmly believe that. And I personally want marine tourism to actually be added to Scotland's already impressive list of global brands, such as bagpipes, whiskey, golf and tartan. I want people across the world to think of, when they think of marine tourism, I want them to think of Scotland, particularly with the, the, the west coast of Scotland and some, such, some of the iconic scenes and beasts that we've actually got there. Marine tourism in Scotland can become a global brand. And I think this year's Commonwealth Flotilla uh, on the 26th of July, sailing from Greenock up to Glasgow, 
Uh, it can certainly provide a huge platform to build upon. Uh, I mean, there's been a legacy from that in terms of that some of the pontoons uh, can, are going to stay within Greenock, and also Dundee has actually been showing an interest in, actually, in that particular element, uh, as well as uh, the contributed, uh, that particular event has contributed to the development of an event strategy within the context of, uh, emerging marine, of the emerging marine tourism strategy. Uh, and certainly some of the figures that, that have actually come out uh, of that particular that event, um, it's, it was estimated that over 23% over of those who actually took part, and 1,900 people were on the boats, over 23% over of them came from elsewhere within the UK. And it's estimated that their economic impact over the course of not just that day, but the couple of days that they were there, was over £260,000 to the economy. In, in, in Scotland, particularly the West Coast. Now, that's a huge amount of money, but in, certain, uh, in terms of, kind of uh, elsewhere, uh, in terms of the, the spectators, it was estimated that at the upper level to be over 120,000 spectators lining the banks of both sides of the Clyde, uh, with, a, with a, an economic impact of some £962,000. Now, these are tremendous, uh, tremendous figures for an event that only lasted that particular weekend. Uh, there were 284 boats, 1,900 people, uh, and, as I said, up to 120,000 spectators on the banks. The flotilla was, uh, was actually first discussed in our cross-party group a number of years ago, and we were happy to support it. And certainly the many people who were actually involved in making it happen deserve a tremendous amount of credit for that, whether it was uh, from RYA Scotland or from local authorities who actually put the money in. So I certainly want to put on record today my thanks to them uh, and also to everyone who actually assisted to make it actually happen. But I'm conscious of time, presiding officer. Um, and the, I, I, I've run out of time just to discuss the issue of the passport checks that, uh, that the, the, the Minister actually touched upon earlier. That's also been an issue for some, certainly for over a year or so now. And I do wish that the UK government would actually get involved in the discussions regarding the passport checks for the cruise industry. Because actually, uh, there is a disproportionate effect upon Scotland. Because uh, proportionally, there are more people actually come to Scotland through, through the cruise industry as compared to elsewhere within the UK. But certainly, uh, I am happy to support uh, the motion today, and I know that certainly Scotland's tourism offering um, it, it's, it's in, good, it's, it's in a good place at the moment, and I know it can only go, from, uh, go on to, be, to bigger and greater things, and I look forward to 2015. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Jean Urquhart to be followed by Graham Day. Uh, thank six you. minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding, presiding Officer. Uh, we can indeed celebrate um, in the soundbite of of BBC Scotland in a year like no other. And I think that's true. It's been exceptional and perhaps understandably the busiest year uh, for Scotland and Scottish uh, tourism businesses, uh, certainly in my lifetime. And as someone who's been involved in the tourism industry for many years, I'm pleased to uh, have the opportunity to acknowledge that. Um, I would like uh, perhaps to, to uh, refer to the, the Minister, to Fergus Ewing, talking about the International Conference, Margaret. And uh, I, very welcome as that is. I'd like to, to make a pitch, I think, for uh, much smaller events that are also important and indeed crucially and as important in the communities who host them. Um, there are many small conferences. In fact, the Islands Book Trust in the Western Isles uh, have repeatedly held an annual conference of international stature with international speakers often. And perhaps uh, venues holding no more than 150 or 200 people. However, I did a few years ago declare Bernary to be the conference capital of the world because of the quality of the whole experience. I've never been better looked after and I doubt any delegate on any conference in any country, no matter how many delegates, could actually have competed with the quality of the food, um, the, uh, the hall, the accommodation, and most of all, of course, the hospitality. We were indeed taken into the community wholeheartedly and uh, celebrated for the, uh, being, just being visitors and being, uh, having that extraordinary welcome that we know that we can do. When we do it well, we do it so well. The other uh, events, I think it's worth mentioning, um, and I was pleased to hear about the bid fund for conferences, and perhaps would make a bid, make a, 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 an attempt at least to recognise that places like Bernera and other small organisations who are having conferences in small places hold just as important a part. Culturally, 
the Highlands and Islands, the area that I represent, is of course on the, on the map with its music festivals, Heb Celt, repeatedly uh, hailed across the United Kingdom as the best festival of its kind. Uh, Rock Ness didn't happen last year, we hope it will come back. The National Mod, of course, going for years. Lupalu in its 10th year. Um, Orkney and Shetland, folk festivals, jazz festivals, fiddle festivals and film festivals. Book festivals are growing, definitely a growing um, market for people who want to take part, often in a much smaller, uh, at a, at a much smaller event. So the experience for both the reader and the author can sometimes be extraordinary uh, special. And I think we do this incredibly well. Small is beautiful and Scotland does make events of scale and quality that challenge any other anywhere in the world and befit the uh, world-class title that they deserve. It's not always recognised um, by uh, Event Scotland or Visit Scotland when they're considering their funding for such events. Um, I was uh, in discussion at one time when they asked me what was international about the self-called International Festival Arts Festival in Nairn. Well, I said it's in the title, and it's certainly in the, um, some of the speakers and the performers who are attending. So I think there's a question mark for me that something that is international needn't necessarily mean hundreds of thousands of people, or even thousands of people. But sometimes it just means a really good international event and that it should be recognised in Scotland for that very thing. For the first time ever, I was amazed for the first time ever. Surely the, the, um, a place that might have had this before, but the first sheepdog trials were held in, uh, for the first time in Scotland, held in Tain and Easter Ross this year, and were, by all accounts, a massive success. It did happen on, on some of the finest days we had, and uh, looked very stunning. The dogs looked great, and they... Uh, dogs did they, they came from all around the world. Uh, surfing, international surfing championships in Caithness and Tyree, um, and the list goes on. But one of the points that I wanted to make is sometimes it's not even the events that are organised, presiding officer, it's events that happen because it's the way we live. And what makes Scotland an attractive country for people to come and visit is actually how we live in any case. Um, it may be hard for us to think that the agricultural show in Barra is uh, a tourist attraction. And we might not even want to give it that label. But for the experience of visitors who come to this country, that's exactly what it is. It's part of their experience of being in Scotland and undoubtedly getting a share to see how people live and work and play in parts of, of the world that they are uh, visiting for the first time. Talking about visiting for the first time, we have one of the highest records for people who visit the first time, visiting a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. So we do know how that goes. We recognise, and we must recognise, that about many of these things, we get it right, just because of who we are. And in that vein, I would also say that the, I think it was Alex Rowley who made the, the point that this isn't something that's set apart from uh, the rest of Scotland, but the work of the local authorities, the infrastructure we have, uh, the A9, the railway lines, the, um, frankly, the public lavatories, whether they're open or whether they're shut, are of as much interest and should be uh, to us in terms of tourism and visiting uh, Scotland. So I think praise is needed for those local, local authorities who just managing to you know, keep our towns and villages, uh, countryside areas looking good, providing bins where they're needed, and a, and a, a structure that means that there is a, a pride in our country, uh, then it, that will indeed encourage people to come and share that with us. Murdo Fraser mentioned the workforce, and I, I would like to finish perhaps by making that... And finally. That, ..making that bid. That it, that we have to look at the wage structure. One of the disappointments, perhaps, of the, the Smith Commission for me is that we don't have control of minimum wages in an, in an industry that is so necessary in this country to start recognising the worth of the people who work within it. Thank you.
Thanks so much. I now call on Graham Day, after which we will move to closing speeches. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, this time of year tends to be one for reflection in the context of this debate. That is entirely appropriate. 2014 in tourism terms has, as everyone has acknowledged, been exceptional for Scotland. And how could it have been otherwise containing as it did a Commonwealth Games, a Ryder Cup and another homecoming event? But I want to very much focus my contribution on the future and how we seize the opportunity before us. And by we, I, I don't simply mean government and its agencies. The motion we are debating, and I quote, urges the Scottish Government to renew its efforts for the years ahead, end quote. And that's as it should be. Government bears the responsibility for providing leadership in this as in other areas. But realising the full tourism potential we have as a country will require more than national funding and initiatives. It will require local buy-in and participation. It will require everyone stepping up to the mark. Uh, Presiding officer, I'm sure it won't surprise you or indeed anybody else that in exploring that, I want to focus on the particular part of the country that I represent here in Parliament. And I, and I do so, I hope, with legitimate reason, given that the County of Angus was very much involved in two of the major tourism magnets of 2014, given that we hosted the Commonwealth Games, the shooting event, along with three of the Homecoming Scotland partner events. It should be acknowledged, Presiding Officer, that unfortunately visitor numbers related to the shooting at Barry Budden did not, it seems, match actual ticket sales. And anecdotal evidence gathered by Angus Council suggests there was little immediate benefit apparent to the accommodation provision sector in the area. However, the hope is that the uh, considerable effort that was put into ensuring visitors or potential visitors to Southern Angus were aware of all the wider county had to offer leading up to the Games, and that will pay dividends moving forward. There are very obvious areas for Angus to exploit. Golf with an open venue in Carnoustie, not to mention open qualifying courses such as Monifeath, Panmure, Barry and Montrose is an obvious example. And it's worth the, um, uh, the, 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 there are other uh, issues in terms of uh, uh, food and drink, for example, going into 2015, which of course is designated the year of food and drink, which offers a, a great opportunity for the county, uh, the county. In previous food and drink debates in this chamber, I've highlighted the enormous contribution made to that sector of our economy by uh, Angus. It's worth recapping, if only to note the evolutionary nature of this. Angus is a bit more than the world-famous smoky. We take to market a range of other renowned fish baits products. We have a multi-million pound soft fruit sector, a vibrant farming sector, highly, highly respected preserves production, and a growing drink sector with two brand new vodka distilleries starting up recently as farm diversification projects using locally produced potatoes. We're also home to a particular sector of tourism, agritourism, which I think the Minister would agree offers considerable potential. There is one route being mapped out for Angus, though, and future tourism promotion, which unquestionably offers huge possibilities and which I hope points the way for the kind of all-quarters buy-in that I touched upon earlier. And that relates to 2020, the 700th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Arbroath. I, I should declare an interest here, President Officer. I'm a member of the Arbroath Abbey 2020 group, serving alongside representatives of Angus Council, Visit Scotland, Historic Scotland, and the local Arbroath Abbey Action Group, which is taking forward plans for a year-by-year build-up to the anniversary and then a spectacular 2020, in keeping with the huge importance of the document. The point I want to make here is that what we're doing is, is partnership working and engaging the community. What we're trying to achieve is having all the interested parties, including the local populace who have been asked what kind of events they want to see leading up to, and as part of 2020 itself, actively engaged in delivering something that will benefit both the Angus and wider Scottish economies. And it's, it's a spectacular opportunity to tap into the North American tourism market, something I don't think we've done to anything like the extent we ought to have done in relation to the declaration, given the connections uh, with the American declaration of our bros. There's a real chance if we get this uh, right to encourage visitors from across the pond to Scotland, and specifically Angus, leading up to and during 2020. It was encouraging to see the recently published Visit Britain figures for North American visitors. Do I have time, President Officer? Yes. Right, thank you. Stuart McMillan. I thank Graham Day for taking a, a, the intervention. Uh, would he encourage the Scottish Government to consider 2020 to be uh, another year of homecoming? <laughs> I was hoping we could make it uh, the year of the declaration, but perhaps that's pushing it too much. Um, it, it was encouraging to see the recently published vi Visit Britain figures for North American visitors to these islands showing an increase for the first nine months of 2014 compared to the corresponding period the year previously. But whilst the trend is encouraging, we in Scotland need, I, I think, to think about how we get better enticing those US citizens who perhaps fly into London to venture further north and in greater numbers. The devolution of APD does offer an opportunity in that regard, of course, if cutting the tax leads to more or cheaper direct transatlantic flights. But I think we need to think beyond just that and really push Scotland as a destination 
uh, for that market with. And of course, I would say this, Angus increasingly to the fore uh, in marketing that as we move towards 2020. But, President Officer, in conclusion, I want to return to a point I touched on earlier, if I may, about genuine local buy-in and stepping up to the mark. It's a constant source of frustration to myself as a local MSP, just how disjointed we are when it comes to pulling together our tourism offer in Angus and making our attractions as easy to access as they might be. Glam's Castle is one of the jewels in our crown. It has a successful joint ticketing arrangement with Blair Castle and Schoon Palace in Perthshire. Yet there's no longer any tie-up with the National Trust owned Angus Folk Museum, located at the matter yards from their gates. And that's not the single at uh, Glam's Castle out, it's simply an illustration of a wider issue. In my constituency, we fail generally to cross-promote complementary attractions in different ownership, as we might. And if you are, for example, a rail traveller coming to our broth to see the Abbey, there's no readily accessible public transport to take you on to see Glam's Castle or Barry's birthplace in Kerry Muir. And that's not the fault of the National Tourism Body, but of delivery on the ground at a local level. Although I wonder whether the Minister feels we might find a way to share best practice examples better. In transport uh, transportation terms, the Bredalbin bus scheme, for example, might be one thing that we could share. And that we encourage local authorities and others to grasp the thistle, as it were, and help ensure Scotland's tourism offering uh, and access to it is all that it might be in, in every corner of our country. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And we now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Cameron McCannon. Uh, seven minutes, please, Mr. McKenna. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This afternoon, we've had a highly informative discussion and heard a great deal of praise for Scotland and the hugely successful year for our tourist industry in 2014. We all welcome the success of spectacular events already mentioned held this year from the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup to the ever-present Edinburgh Festival. Having also lived abroad and therefore seen Scottish tourism both from the inside and the outside, I know also quite a lot about the industry. I've also led SCDI missions and missions in my industry on behalf of the SCDI abroad. So I'm well aware of the potential of Scottish tourism. I was going to take up Mr. Rowley's point too about the Resyth Ferry because I took it many, many times and found it great. But the problem with it was that speed limit in the fourth, we could never actually, it was always, took, always took longer to get there than it did if you went from Hull Zeebrug. So therefore it, it, it just wasn't it, economic. We've got to do something about that. I'm all in favour of getting another ferry to Scotland, direct from the continent. It's very important. We used to have them from, I think it was um, Scandinavia to, to Newcastle, Esbjerg, and, but that's all stopped. And I feel that we should really have a ferry industry going straight from Scotland to the continent. Certainly. Ms McDonnell. Thank you. Um, as the member probably knows, I do have a, a debate coming up in January on that specific issue. Um, would you agree that the, the fact that there's no current direct ferry service between the UK and Scandinavia is a missed opportunity in attracting our Nordic friends uh, with a, a high disposable income to Scotland by car? Cameron McKenna. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. I would definitely agree that it is a, a missed opportunity and it certainly does not help our industry because the Scandinavians are very important to us. So all these events have added to our tourism industry. And what we must recognize is that the government needs to secure the legacy we've had recently and can't simply await it. With this in mind, I think we have an opportunity to discuss how the government can boost the industry and secure a lasting legacy. And in this respect, my colleagues' point, uh, points on APD are most welcome. It is important that the momentum from our success in 2014 is carried forward to the long-lasting benefit for all of Scotland. Programmes to encourage participation in sport, particularly amongst young people, are most welcome and will stand Scotland in good stead for the sporting success in the future. The Government would be, do well to make this a primary legacy of the Commonwealth Games and avoid legislation that will make participation in any sport harder for young people, or indeed anybody. Another crucial point in this debate is that the Government should facilitate boosts to both sides of the tourism industry, the supply of it as well as the demand. I'm not saying that the government should fund all tourism businesses, but rather that where help can be offered, we should do so, and where it already exists, we should therefore maintain it. Renewed domestic and, interest, and international interest in our golf could be used to reinvest in Scotland's golf clubs and clubhouses to again reinforce our status as a golfing destination of choice. To achieve this, the government could help by perhaps not stepping in, but stepping back. Business rate cuts for golf clubs could help them boost their membership, and their, as their saved income could be used to invest in and improve their facilities as well as reduce membership fees. In any case, it would be useful to discuss the merits of, these, of this, such a move. Unfortunately, the legislative programme set up by the First Minister for her government has set a worrying precedent here. 
Rural businesses that involve shooting or fishing, which are very popular tourist pastimes both overseas and here, will be hit with a rating system introduced at a cost of some £7 million a year by the year 2016. This tax on rural businesses, which depends on Scotland worldwide fame as a place of natural beauty for outdoor sports, will raise their costs and thereby, thereby lead to price increases for tourists. This is not what our clubs need to attract tourists. We want a legacy that supports all businesses in the tourism industry, and this government should aim to do exactly that. We must remember that rural tourism is not only about tweed jackets and trips in Land Rovers, but actually spans all manners of activities and supports a huge amount of rural employment. Certainly. Jean Urquhart. Would you agree that business rates on other businesses, uh, uh, would you fight for them to be abolished as well? They also have costs and it has to be reflected in the price. Why would you exempt uh, land and estates with sporting activities? Cameron McCannon. Thank you. We have the small businesses bonus scheme, which actually helps with that. But I'm not really advocating a great reduction in, every, in, in all the business rates, because we've got to fund them from somewhere. What I'm, I was going to say, the other point I was going to make was the government initiative for the year of food and drink in 2015 presents a super chance to broaden the tourism legacy of 2014, from sporting success on and off the field to another pillar of Scottish tourist industry. We need more Scottish restaurants or restaurants serving Scottish food. People often, often say to me, I want to go to a good Scottish restaurant. There are many around, but they're not particularly, I don't think they're particularly advertised. The food and drink sector amounts for a huge, accounts for a huge portion of our tourist industry. 179,000 people are employed in the accommodation and food services. That was up until June 2014. We should do all we can to help them tap into the momentum for our success this year. A particularly potent point in this respect was raised by the Smiths Commission report when it stated that parties have agreed that the Scottish and the UK governments should work together to seek, with respect to food labelling, to agree changes to the European country of origin rules so that Made in Scotland brand is recognised under EU law. I wholeheartedly agree with this and trust all parties can come together to pursue this as firmly as we can. Recognition of our brand would do so much more to boost our food and drink businesses, as we've seen all over the continent. And it would increase our reputation both at home and abroad and contribute to the appeal of visiting Scotland as a place of outstanding food and top quality drink, which we've all spoken about and we all agree. Finally, I'd like to reiterate my support for, for Murder Fraser's points calling on the government to set out its plans to reduce or preferably eradicate eventually the air passenger duty. We Scottish Conservatives have called on AP, a, APD to be devolved for some time and warmly welcome the agreement of the Smith Commission on this. I would like to make the point that in line with other areas of policy where powers are to be devolved, what Scotland needs is a government devoted to using its powers in Scotland's best interest rather than focusing on blame games and demanding powers that we did not vote for. What we and our other tourist industries would like to see now is a commitment from the government to con use control of the APD to relieve the hefty tax burden he's gone, to relieve the hefty tax burden on air travel and thereby boost tourism to the benefit of the whole country. Accordingly, presiding officer, I hope that the government goes beyond talking the talk on boosting tourism and actually walks the walk. We are agreed that the events of 2014 have given a lot of momentum to tourism in Scotland, but for this to turn into a lasting legacy, the government must deliver policies that support it. Such initi initiatives have come in many forms, and it seems clear that using the power to reduce or eradicate air PD would, be, would have tangible and lasting benefits. I therefore support the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Patricia Ferguson. Eight minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Next Sunday, Glasgow will host the BBC Sports Personality of the Year Awards, the first time this prestigious event has been held in Scotland, and an opportunity to mark the end of a marvellous year for tourism and a year in which Scotland shone on the sporting stage. Some 12,000 people will attend the event, in itself, no doubt, another modest boost to our tourism numbers. And those present, whether they be athletes, commentators or indeed volunteers, will have the chance to reminisce with the viewing public about the amazing year of sport we have all enjoyed and the preeminent role Scotland has played in its delivery. Since the idea of hosting the Games was first mooted, the opportunity to secure the widest possible legacy was part of the planning process. It is early days, of course, but initial evaluations suggest that the planning and preparation has paid off. And indeed, some of the early figures are quite remarkable. 
250,000 unique visitors staying in Scotland for at least one night, but on average staying 5.8 nights, which equates to 1.7 million visitor days. 3.4 million people passing through Glasgow Central Station and over a million mentions on social media. Publicity you couldn't afford to buy. And of course, as we've heard, 93% of visitors rating Scotland a good place to visit. Now, those are the official statistics, providing, presiding officer, but the story told locally bears them out. I often regard taxi drivers as a good barometer of opinion, and the two I happened to speak to during the Games reported much increased business, with one having a very welcome return fare to Barry Budden, and the other reporting that he had transported a couple from England who had come for the weekend to experience the Games, but had found out to their surprise that Glasgow also had a magnificent civic art collection and were already planning a return winter break to the city, something that they had never previously considered. We know that 9% of the visitors came from overseas, and indeed I had the real pleasure of meeting up with one of my cousins who travelled back to his home city from Tasmania, where he has lived for the first time in 25 years. He was in Glasgow to watch his sports of triathlon and judo and was taken aback by the transformation that he saw in Glasgow. We know too that accommodation during August in Glasgow was at its highest for a very long time, if not perhaps its highest ever, with occupancy rates over 95% and indeed in five nights of the month of August at the astounding rate of 99%. And we know too that the spend was estimated to be around £282 million. But of course, none of that came without a great deal of hard work and effort. And the long-term commitment of Visit Scotland, Event Scotland and the Glasgow City Marketing Bureau must, of course, have uh, contributed hugely to that, as it does to so much else of what happens in Scotland. But it wasn't just, of course, in Glasgow that we had great success. The Commonwealth Games themselves brought a huge impact in terms of tourism to Angus, to Edinburgh, to Lanarkshire and to Tayside. And, of course, the Ryder Cup added to that sporting effect. And it wasn't just sport. It was Festival 2014, the Edinburgh Festival, the MTV Awards and, as we approach them now, the winter festivals that many people look forward to. And I was very keen to hear what the Minister had to say about themed years. Um, I seem to recall he and I were both at the launch or the opening of the very first themed year in 2007 on a very cold and wet night in Inverness when the Year of Highland Culture was unveiled. And I think these years are contributing to the tourism offer in our country because they tap into the individual interests of people who might want to come here. The important thing I think about them is that we herald them well in advance. Now, my colleague um, Duncan McNeill intervened on the Minister to talk about a subject that I know has been dear to his heart for a very long time, and that's the cruise ships that go into Greenock. Um, I suspect the Minister has shared with me the experience of visiting Greenock to see for himself what actually happens. And I have to say that the efforts of the volunteers who greet those ships and who make the people embarking from them welcome has to be encouraged. I also was very interested in the fact that the Disney ship is going to be going into Orkney, as I understand it from the Minister, and that perhaps Mickey Mouse will be visiting those islands. That's perhaps one ministerial protocol to be avoided. Bruce Crawford was absolutely right to say that we will all want to talk about the individual events and issues that we have locally, and that's absolutely right, and it's absolutely good to do. But it's also good to be able to use or to bring together that impressive jigsaw that is Scotland when we have all those elements pulled together and can talk about them in a debate like this. And Alec Rowley and Murdo Fraser brought to our attention a couple of issues that have dogged the industry for quite some time and that we never seem to have managed to crack. Those are the issues around skills, pay, and I would add the profile and status of the tourism and catering industries. 
because without the profile and the status, you can't encourage people to want to gain the skills. And without the pay, you also probably cannot attract people into the industry. And I think we perhaps, going forward, need to concentrate a little more on that. Uh, John Mason quite rightly identified that people will come to Scotland for different reasons. I once had a very good conversation with a gentleman in Marseille who told me that he loved Scotland. And when I asked him what it was about Scotland he loved, was it our castles, was it our scenery, he said no. He really liked the fact that Scotland was really, really grey because he found that very romantic. It's not quite how I see our grey winter's days, but it just shows you that other people are looking for other things. The very real contribution of conferences and sports tourism uh, was identified by Hans Malik, and I think he's absolutely right about that. And it does perhaps suggest that there is um, something in that for other areas of the country, in that they should identify the niche that they can best attract and work hard to develop that. Uh, my colleague Anne McTaggart mentioned that people make Glasgow and she's absolutely right to highlight that particular slogan. And she also mentioned that she thinks Glasgow is still better than Edinburgh. I might have wanted to resist saying that I think it's still miles better than <laughs> Edinburgh, but perhaps I shouldn't have gone there. Presiding officer, for me, the Commonwealth Games typified the partnership working that makes big events and our tourism industry so successful in Scotland and I think Graham Day was right to remark on partnership working in that respect because those games would not have been possible without the hard work and commitment of many people. The Commonwealth Games Federation for Scotland, the government, the local government in Glasgow, Glasgow 2014, transport staff, hotel and catering staff, council workers and of course the 15,000 plus volunteers who were such a successful part of the games many of whom were themselves visitors to our country. As you draw to a close. Thank you, Presiding yes. Officer. I believe that, Scotland, uh, that tourism in Scotland is thriving and has the capacity to grow further, but it needs support from all of us to do that. On Sunday night, the Sports Personality of the Year Awards will identify the outstanding performances in their field. Those will be recognised. It may be a partisan point, Presiding Officer, but I think there should be a special recognition at those awards for the city of Glasgow and for all it achieved during the Commonwealth Games. Thank you. Thank you for that completely unbiased view. And I now call on Fergus Ewing to close the debate. Minister, you have until five o'clock. Well, this has been an excellent debate, uh, Senior Officer, full of uh, thoughtful and stimulating and interesting uh, contributions, uh, and more so than, than any debate in tourism I can recall, and I can recall um, quite a few. And I do want to respond to some of the points that were made uh, by members. But <clears throat> first, could I just make a serious point that I have made before about accessible tourism? Because um, whilst all of us here perhaps take for granted that we can each year enjoy an annual holiday or a break, um, the startling statistics which I quoted before with regard to the 11 million people in the UK who have a disabil disability is that only 2 million of them um, have a holiday or break each year. That means that four out of five do not. And those four out of five very often say that this is because it is, quotes, too difficult, quotes. This really is something which is, I think, unacceptable and which I think we all wish to tackle. And uh, I'm very pleased, therefore, that Visit Scotland has been leading the way on this with their access statement and their online training kit. And I really do exhort all members to use their substantial influence in their patch. Have a look at the online training kit. Look at what an access statement is. Encourage businesses uh, and also providers of transport and visitor attractions anywhere that is public facing to have a look at this and take it up. I've made the same challenge to every tourism conference I've spoken at recently and I do believe that this is something that can be done without an enormous expenditure of money because much of it is not about physical infrastructure, it's about attitudes, respect, courtesy, and a welcome to everybody. Um, and I'd like to pay tribute to a number of people who've really been leading the quest to give people with disability the same opportunities to enjoy a holiday as the rest of us. And these include Ewan MacDonald, a young man with motor neuron disease, who has set up a website which features 
impartial user-generated accessibility reviews, a sort of trip advisor for people with a disability in Scotland. Have a look at Ewan's guide. I think you will be fascinated by it. And others, including Philip Briggs, who's profoundly deaf, Sally Hyder, um, MS and wheelchair user, author and public speaker with her assistance dog Harmony, Moira Henderson, the owner of the Rings Fife, uh, where I uh, laid the Cairnstone in August. These individuals and others are driving this forward, giving of their time for free, uh, along with Visit Scotland, Chris McCoy and a team. So let's set an objective of Scotland seeking to become a country which is famed and renowned for offering people with disability the same opportunity to enjoy a holiday as elsewhere. Um, it's within our grasp if we actually do it and walk the walk. Um, so too in a, on social tourism is about helping people undertake holiday and leisure activities who would not otherwise be able to do so. And the increasing take up here is important as well. Um, I'm delighted to say that we are providing a grant of 59,000, including 12,000 pounds from the Scottish Carers Policy Budget to support a pilot run by Shared Care Scotland across four council areas, which will seek to link with the hospitality sector and carer support organisations for carers. It's so difficult for carers to get a break themselves. We all know this from our work in our constituencies. Some spend their whole lives looking after one person in one house, very often a bit isolated. So that's a worthy task, and I'm sure all members would agree with that. Presiding officer, can I just turn and try and deal with some of the, the points that have been made during the debate? Um, uh, uh, there are a huge number of business conferences that we've won. Jenny Mara asked me for details, so here goes. In Glasgow this year, we will see the European Arterial Sclerosis Society, the European Association for International Education, Human Genetics, Dental Implantology, Cytometry, the British Pain Society, European Congress on Operational Research, Commonwealth Law Conference, Panel and Conference Organisers, European Stroke Organisation. Uh, we will see many more conferences. Each one of those is a result not simply of the subvention fund, but of a terrific team effort between the local authority, as Alec Rowley rightly said in his contribution, the Scottish Government, the Visit Scotland Business Tourism Unit, and very often Royal Societies of Medicine, where we have a Scottish representative who can be the advocate for Scotland to bring a conference to one of Scotland's towns or cities. And we also to take up Jean Urquhart's point, are seeking to spread the benefit around islands and around remote and rural communities uh, uh, and rural areas in general. Fort William, Arran are two that spring to mind, but she is absolutely correct and we are committed to that. Jenny Mara rightly highlighted the opportunity for extender holidays. If people come, 84,000 of them, to conferences, we want them to come back. We want them to bring their families back. We want them to have pre- and post-conference extender holidays. I don't think we've got that right yet, and I've said so repeatedly. And I think it's partly for business to make commercial arrangements to promote uh, opportunities uh, when people are at conferences and also to come back. Uh, Murdo Fraser uh, and various others in the debate highlighted training, and of course there is a lot of good things that have been done in training. I can say that Skills Development Scotland are doing a lot of work in this. It may be that in his capacity as convener of the committee, he may wish to seek more information about that. There's too much information to share now. But we are on the case, and I think some of the points he made were perfectly valid. But there is great work being done. I mean, things like Junior Master Chef, things like the mentoring of expert chefs like Andrew Fairley and uh, the uh, redoubtable Albert Roux, whose love for Scotland is that, uh, that only a French person could actually achieve, uh, and the work he does in Inverness, they are inspiring young people all around the country, uh, and that's a terrific thing. So mentoring is great. And also uh, Springboard, also work in Strathclyde University, also the uh, work that QM University is doing, along with businesses in the east of Scotland. These are all excellent initiatives, but I think there is a feeling that more needs to be done, and we haven't quite cracked it yet. And indeed, uh, as has been said, without people of various, uh, coming from various countries in mainland Europe to Scotland, from East Europe, but also Northern Europe and Spain and Portugal as well, where wouldn't be a hotel open in Scotland? There would barely be any hotels and restaurants in Scotland were it not for the fact that we are happy to have people from these countries come and commit themselves to Scotland. 
make a determination to work here, and that's something that we very much welcome. Bruce Crawford made uh, an interesting speech, and his recommendation of a cross-party group in tourism, I very much hope, is one that will be taken up. It's an excellent suggestion. Alex Rowley highlighted the, the need for local authorities to play an increasing role. The development framework that we brought forward this year uh, seeks to work uh, more effectively with local authorities, and there are signs it's working already. Um, Joan McAlpin referred to agritourism uh, and the need to cut VAT. Recently, I had the pleasure of uh, speaking at a Farm Stay UK conference in uh, uh, Stephen Leckie's uh, establishment in Creef Hydro. In fact, the conference delegates were staying so long in the Creef Hydro that I, I wondered whether they were making a, some sort of bid to obtain security of tenure. Uh, but it was certainly a very enjoyable experience. And bodies like Go Rural are making a big impact in the farming world, presiding officer, as perhaps you know better than anybody else in this chamber. Uh, John Mason also highlighted uh, a, his interest in beer, uh, several times actually, and camping, and pleasant beaches on Tyree. And I can share with members that uh, at a business tourism conference this morning, uh, Louise White from Good Morning Scotland said that she enjoys beach holidays when she dons her wetsuit in beaches in Tyree. So there we are. I've just boosted uh, uh, tourism in Tyree, I think, uh, presiding officer. <laughs> Stuart McMillan highlighted the work that he does on cruise tourism, and this was recognised by the EU. I don't know if he's aware of this, but after listening to a meeting that he chaired, the EU invited a Scottish representative to put forward the case at Venice. Uh, uh, and uh, many other members made interesting contributions to the debate. Uh, I think one of the key points is that perhaps there's a lot more we can do to attract people in Scotland to enjoy holidays in Scotland. I've always thought that. And that was uh, a point that was made by, I think, Mr Rowley, although I'm not quite sure. Uh, uh, and I think it was a point very well made indeed. And the same applies to our friends south of the border. They are a key market. And we have to continue to focus on that market. Uh, and, uh, of course, everyone from England is extremely welcome to come to Scotland, enjoy a holiday, and spend a great deal of their money here. Um, and, of course, reference was made to the rough guide, which uh, praised, for example, Lewis and Harris as foremost amongst the whole islands in Europe, the best of all, as I can testify, from holiday that we enjoyed there. I would conclude by saying that whilst I did not attend MTV Europe myself, although I believe that it... Uh, it's a showcase for popular music in the post-Frank Sinatra era. <laughs> I can conclude by saying, from words that I do know, by the great late Al Jolson, presiding officer, tourism in Scotland, you ain't seen nothing yet. Many thanks. He did it his way. And so that concludes the debate on tourism, a legacy from 2014. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 11767 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revision to tomorrow's business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak buttons now. And as no one has, I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11767. Minister. Formally moved. Thank you. No member has asked to speak against the motion, so I will now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 11767, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. And now we come to decision time, which is the next item of business. And there is one question to be put as a result of today's business. And the question is that motion 11756, in the name of Fergus Ewan, on tourism, a legacy from 2014, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. So the motion is therefore agreed to. And that concludes decision time. And we will now move on to members' business. And I'd ask members who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly.